Uh, so, James, you're into your 17th season uh, with Doncaster Rovers. How do you feel it's gone so far this year? Um, yeah, for me personally, it's a little bit different. Things have changed. Um, as you get older, you... Well, it hasn't really, to be honest. Like, for me, I've played 42 games every season for the past 18 seasons, um, averaged. So, this is the first season that I've had a little bit of a... Um, a different viewpoint, not as many minutes as I would like. Um, but I can't, again, 40 in January, I can't really complain. Um, and again, it's about me adapting to that sort of role, trying to help the younger players that we've got in the squad. I think we've we've got a, a really young squad at the minute. Um, and collectively, we've done really well so far this season. We've sort of in and around the playoffs with a few games in hand. Um, and yeah, we're sort of building momentum and, and picking up some good results. Yeah. So, uh, James, you've, you've said, I believe, that this is going to be your final season uh, of a long career. Uh, what would you say has been your personal highlight? Um, it's a good question. I think 20, 23 years in professional football, spanning all divisions. Um, so Premier League, Championship League, One League Two and the National League. And throughout the whole time, there's there's been that many. It's it's hard to pinpoint one. Um, I've had sort of promotions. Uh, we won the Johnson's Paint Trophy in the Millennium Stadium. I've scored that goal at Brentford that won us the the championship. Um, but my individual performance, probably my hat trick against Southend um, in the semi final at home. Um, yeah, that, that got us to the final against Leeds at Wembley was probably the highlight of my my sort of career personally. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we were said about the hat-trick against Southend and how brilliant it was. But how did it feel putting your team into the final obviously against Leeds United? Um, yeah, it was it was a special night. Obviously, for me personally, I had just sort of got relegated out of the Football League with Exeter and to rebuild my career and to be in that sort of position, um, to score that hat-trick and the, the three goals that I scored were were good goals as well. Um and missing out on the last day of the season, we went to Cheltenham on the last day of the season, knowing that if we'd won, we'd get promoted with with Swansea that season and we got beat um, and obviously we went into the playoffs. So even more so, um, but then going to Leeds, uh, going to Wembley and beating Leeds, um, yeah, it was a dream come true for me and, and everybody involved. Uh, so... You were involved in arguably one of the most uh, dramatic finishes to any season in 2013 when you scored uh, a last-minute winner on Caster off the back of a Brentford penalty that they missed with pretty much the last kick of the season. Uh, how did it feel, you know, scoring that goal to secure Doncaster the title in such dramatic fashion? Yeah, again, I think, like, growing up as a kid, you, you dream about moments like that. Um I was on loan at Nottingham Forest for the first part of the season, came back in January and played every game up until that moment. Um, I knew that coming back, the lads were motivated and doing really well. And I just sensed that it was going to be a special season. And then to go into that game, knowing that we we needed a draw and that was it, nil-nil all the way till the 90th minute and then concede a penalty, you just think the worst. You think we're back into the playoffs. Um another two, three weeks of working hard. Um, and then he, he hits the bar and um, all hell breaks loose. The ball gets cleared and, and I just set off running. And um, luckily for me, Billy Painter squared it and I tapped it in. And, you know, to be in front of the Doncaster fans, to be the last, almost the last kick of the game on the last day of the season, like you couldn't have wrote it any better for me and, and the players involved. So... Um, yeah, I took my shirt off, threw it in the crowd. Um, and yeah, for me, again, it was a dream come true. It was a moment that uh, very few people experience uh, throughout their careers. Now, I was just going to ask a bit off the cuff. On, on the, you know, the following season, you know, you experienced, you know, you experienced the high that season. The following season, you experienced complete polar opposite. I think, was it a last minute Birmingham City goal that, you know, relegated you? How did that feel? Um, yeah, and we got relegated on goal difference, um, which again is you work so hard 
it's it's a really good question because you work so hard to get promoted, um, but you work just as hard to stay in the division for a club like Doncaster to be in the championship at that that sort of stage of um, where the club is at. It's everything comes down to that moment um, again, nil nil, right up until the 80th minute. Um, we know we're safe with a draw, and we concede a penalty. They score, and then we hear that Birmingham have scored. Um, yeah, it's it's you know what it's like you said there. It's polar opposites. It's it's the best feeling in the world to the worst feeling in the world. Um, knowing that you're getting relegated and that um, everything changes, your wages changes, the teams that you're going to play against changes, um, the players that are coming in change, um, everything at, at a football club changes and. Um, again from 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 top to bottom so when you get promoted your money goes up potentially um you better players come in and train and play with you you go to better grounds you go to better stadiums um and the opposite with with what happened so it was really difficult to take especially again having experienced one um but that's part of football that's part of professional football and you've got a you've got to learn and, and try and put it put it be behind you and, and move forward, which which is something that I've really, really sort of worked on and been able to do. I've been relegated three times and um and then been promoted the same or this the, the year we've been relegated, I've been promoted the next year, which again is really difficult to do. Um so no that's a really good question, Alex. Yeah, uh, so we're just going to move on to your earlier playing days. Uh, you're signed by Kenny Dalgleish at Newcastle as a youngster. Uh, how did it feel to become a Premier League footballer? Um, yeah, it was. I would like to say a dream come true, but I'd never, I never, I never wanted to be a professional footballer growing up. It wasn't something that I aspired to be. It wasn't in a school of excellence. Um, it wasn't at an academy. I played grassroots football all the way up until I was sixteen. Um, so for me, I just love playing football, hence the reason I'm still playing at 39, 40. So when I signed for Newcastle, it was it was amazing because of how big the club is and um the history of the club and, and everything about the club. It was it was a, a really special moment for me. But I never felt like I was a Premier League player. Um I, I signed for Newcastle, I played in the under 17s, under 19s. Um and yeah, it was it was a really special moment that, that I'll never forget, really. Yeah. Um, so off the back of that, what was what was Kenny like to work with? And, you know, you made your only Premier League appearance against Spurs. You know, could you just like kind of talk us through the day? Yeah, so... Being told that you were going to be in the squad and... Yeah, Kenny, Kenny was the manager, um, but he wasn't there for very long. Um, I had Alan Irving, who is assistant manager at West Ham, now he's my youth team manager and John Carver, who is um, Scotland national team assistant manager. Um, so I had two really good um, coaches in them, two uh, really good mentors. And yeah, I, I, I did really well. And under 17s and under 19s, we got into the, the Youth Cup uh, semi-final against Coventry. Um, so things were going really well for me. Uh, Rude Hullet came in in between that time. I uh, went on on pre-season tour with with the first team, did really well, uh, scored some goals, took some penalties while Alan Shearer was on the bench. Um, and then Sir Bobby Robson came in and put everybody on the transfer list, all the reserves on the transfer list. I then went on loan to Hartlepool, um, did well, came back and yeah, made my Premier League debut against Tottenham um, partner and Alan Shearer up front, which again was a special moment for me. Um, 19 years old, playing Sunday League at 16, and then making your Premier League debut at 19 um, was was unbelievable. Obviously, finding out I was in the squad um, late on, and then yeah, getting on um, for 15 minutes was was brilliant. It, again, it was it was something that I'd worked really hard for, and was really pleased that it had happened. And if I could just ask, you know. Obviously, Bobby Robson, one of the most iconic, loved figures in English football. Was he, was he as he appeared in the media spotlight in a professional capacity? Yeah, he was, he was very um, endearing, enthusiastic, um, infectious, all them, all them sort of words that people use about him. He, 
he believed in me, he trusted me. Um, and yeah, I'll be forever grateful for him to, for making, for giving me my debut. But at the same time, um, if you needed a telling off, he would tell you off. Um, I remember once I'd, I'd made my debut, I'd gone out and bought a, a flash car and uh, parked it next to his and we warmed up um, next to next to the, the, the car park and he, I could see him pointing to my car. Um, we warmed up and we walked, we, we jogged round and as I came round, he sort of got all the group in the first team and he was like, whose is that car? Um, and I was like, I put my hand up and he went, who do you think you are? Like, who do you think you are? And my son works in a, in a factory nine till five every single day. You've made one appearance. Um, and he absolutely belittled me in front of every single player. Um, at the time, it was it was tough to take um, because I never bought that car out of anything but sort of, you know, a young kid wanting to wanting something nice. Um, but yeah, he was he was he was really sort of really good. And and I left Newcastle. Um, and sort of three or four years later, when I went to Doncaster, there was a friend of mine who knew him and he was asking after me, seeing how I was. Um, and he always had time for you. He always had time for you whenever you went to see him. Um, he was absolutely brilliant. And as I've grown older, I've learned to understand that he was right uh, when I thought he was wrong. Um, when you're young and naive, you always think, well, a lot of the time you think that he's having a go at you, but um, that was never the case. Uh, and like I say, that that league game uh, against Spurs uh, went on to be your only league game for for the Magpies. How did you cope with being released from Newcastle at such a young age? Um, I, I made I made the conscious decision myself. I had a year on my contract. I'd been on loan twice to Hartlepool, um, and I I wasn't happy going back playing reserve team football. Um, and I never played football for the for the footballers tag. I never played football because I was at Newcastle and I was pretending to be a Premier League player. I played football because I wanted to play football. Um, I see it now with a lot of 23s players, 21s players that are happy um, carrying their wash bags, thinking they're, they're players and they've never actually played a, a, or made an appearance for the first team. Um, that wasn't me. So I made the conscious decision to move to Exeter, um, although Newcastle, Newcastle were happy to for me to do that um I never I never saw it has been released um and I went down there starting my journey starting to rebuild my career at 21 um hoping that I would sort of kick start and and, and start my rise back into sort of the championship premier league um so your whole experience of leaving newcastle uh, you know and you'd mentioned being a young a young footballer at St a big club. Um, did that inspire you to start up Pro Mindset? And can you tell us a bit more about what you do and what Pro Mindset do? Yeah, I, I set Pro Mindset up five years ago, but I worked with um, Terry Gormley um, at Doncaster. So my first season at Doncaster, um, when I when we got relegated out of the Football League, so I went from Sunday League to Premier League to non-league in five seasons. Um, so I basically experienced everything um, there is to experience, the highs and lows uh, within five years. In that time, my mum and dad divorced and I lost my granddad to, to cancer. Um, my granddad was, was my hero growing up. He took me everywhere, um, as well as my mum and dad. Um, so my, my world fell apart, really. Um, and that's not what people see. What people see is day to day, me training, me playing games. Um, they don't know what's going on behind the scenes and um, on the back of that, I had no real family home to go back to because my mum and dad had divorced. Um, and I was I was sort of playing in non-league and I just couldn't believe what happened. Um, I ended up playing well and doing well and getting a move to Doncaster, but at the same time, things weren't right. Um, I was doing well in training, but couldn't replicate that on a match day. And I met Terry Gormley, um, you could say a sports psychologist, um, and I didn't actually know what I was getting myself into. I didn't actually know what I was doing. Uh, I just got told to the manager to go and meet this guy at, at, at the stadium. Um, and within that first session, it changed. I don't mind saying it, it changed my life. It changed everything that um, 
I was about on and off the pitch. My career from that moment on has gone from strength to strength. Um, I'm married. I've got three kids. I've done unbelievable things that I would never have, have, have thought was possible outside of the pitch um, as well. So knowing this and understanding this and putting this into practice, um, I was well aware that a lot of footballers go through these sort of things. Um, the mental side of the game for me is the biggest part of professional football. It's the biggest part of life. Um, learning to deal with disappointment, learning to deal with success, like we've just spoke about, the ups and downs, the highs, the lows. Um, and knowing that you have an opportunity to, to improve and get better every single day um, is a huge part of, of everything that we do. So setting up Pro Mindset um, was really, really beneficial for me and, and the players that were involved. And then also, I'd say in the last sort of six months, seven months, um, this sort of format uh, online, reaching out to players, uh, mentoring players, um, from all levels, from all ages, um, from 16 to, to 30, um, has been really, really good for me and really good for, for everybody that's been involved. Uh, and like you say, obviously, you went through a lot as a, as a young player uh, with everything going on behind the scenes that, that people can't see. Um, do you think enough is done for these young sports stars, especially within football, uh, for their mental health? Um, I think it's it's it was never ever spoke about mental health, mental performance, um, psychology. When I was at Newcastle, this sort of thing, there was no there was nobody within the club that that worked on this. Um, and as times evolved, um, there's there's more people involved. The higher you go up into the Premier League, um, I imagine even actually drilling down and looking into it. Uh, I spoke to people at Liverpool through lockdown. I spoke to their first team psychologist who I worked with at Doncaster. And then I spoke to their academy director, Alex Inglethorpe. Um, and they they said to me that, that this is at the forefront of every single thing that they do. Um, Liverpool are, are were the European Championship, uh, European champions, the Premier League champions, the world champions. Um, that they're currently, the, in my opinion, the best team um, in the world um, and it, it, it was really refreshing to hear that um, this sort of thing is, is at the forefront of everything that they do from um, the academy all the way up to the first team. Jurgen Klopp is a huge believer in, in, um, in this sort of thing and uh, communicating in the right way. Um, the player comes first before uh, the person comes first before the player um, and it's huge you know I think I think in the next five to ten years It'll get massive. It'll get bigger. Um, people will be more aware of it, and people will be more aware of, you know, mental performance and mental health isn't something that's weird and wonderful. Like you don't have to wait until something you've got something wrong or you get a disappointment. Um, you can do this every single day and work on it at training, um, at home. It's all about building strategies, coping mechanisms, um, things that work for you. Um, so I would say be prepared rather than wait for something to happen. Uh, so you just obviously gave a little bit of advice there, but if you could directly talk to a, any young footballer who's just been told uh, they're going to be let go by an academy or whatnot, what, what would your message to them be? I think that's a really difficult one because my, my, um, my advice would be sort of, to, to clubs and to people in general is is to be this should be implemented around 14 um so you should there should be a, a phase of this from 14 to 16 and then a different phase from 16 to 18 um and then as you develop into professional football you can then um you can then sort of have this and use this uh moving forward so when you do get released or when you do feel, you deal uh, when you do uh, experience disappointment um, then it's about understanding that, that it's just a disappointment. It's not the end of the world. It's not something that is a is a is a foregone conclusion, and that's it. You don't have, you're never going to play football again. Um, the amount of people that I know that have been released and had setbacks, um, been told they're not good enough, and have gone on to play professional football, going to play in the Premier League, going to play in the Champions League go out and play at the highest level and not just the highest level, level you've got championship league one league two 
uh, and the National League now that I believe you can you can carve out careers. So just because you get released from one football club doesn't mean that's the end for you. Um, and it's not just now that that's a realisation. That's been going on for years and years and years. It's about how you deal with that. It's, how, it's about how you deal with disappointment that sets you apart. Almost use it as a motivation to go, you know what, this isn't the end for me. I'm going to find out how to how to get to another club, how to do this, how to do that. Um, and ask, you know, I think a big thing is asking questions and asking the right questions. Um, because if you sit there and do nothing, you're never going to get anything. Uh, whereas if, if you if you go out there and, and, and almost come out your comfort zone and go, right, I'm going to find out how to do it. Um, so there's loads of different facets to it, but um, the biggest will be trying to use it as a motivation rather than um, a disappointment. Um, you talk about comfort zones. Obviously, you moved from... Newcastle all the way down to Exeter that's that's a long way is, is, you know was that a decision to come out of your comfort zone and try and excel your career I think I think at the time um again I talk about small town mentality and I had that um I grew up in a small town very rarely did I move out of of Gisborough um so I went in, went to Middlesbrough every now and again went to Redcar every now and again but that was as far as I went um and in that town, everybody knew everybody. Um, you were constantly getting judged. Um, and yeah, nobody really sort of believed that they could achieve anything. I, that's, that's, that's where I was. Um, so moving out of that and actually understanding there's, there's this whole world out there. Um, although it didn't go well for me at Exeter in them two years, I got relegated out of the league. Um, my lifestyle was terrible. I was doing things that, um, professional athletes shouldn't have been doing. Um, it was it was the first time I'd ever experienced anything away from my mum and dad, uh, my sort of support network, and I had to learn and learn quickly. 